sweet songs of sadness, of quenchless yearning for the light, for my love, your true home. Long your heart has played the dancer, long you've toyed with mirrors, shadows of the treasures left behind you, deep in your soul, long you've flung the dark for answers, long you've begged from beggars, empty hands, gifts of life, they too were seeking, gifts none could share. Very nice. Can you pronounce the word clearly as it's very important to do? So I talked to you this morning, and it seems to me I should talk further, because that's this, after all, is Hollywood. And <laughs> somehow the inspiration came to me last year um, to write a couple of movies. And I wanted to talk about those. One of them is about autobiography of a yogi but you know, the autobiography of a yogi, I don't think it'll ever make a movie because there's no plot to it. And also because he always, he writes about everybody else but himself. And uh, what you get in the autobiography and the most inspiring thing of all is not the stories, not the miracles, not the saints he met, but the absolutely wonderful attitude he had in confrontation with every situation is just inspiring. So anyway, what I've done is, as I said, I began with the uh, Jesus appearing to Babaji. Then I showed a few scenes from his childhood. And uh, 
Um, just a few, a number of them though that are not in the autobiography. I'm probably the only person in the world who could write such a book because I know the stories, I've heard them from him personally. And uh, so I, anyway, I ended the first part before the intermission with the two penniless boys in Brindaban, which is a really inspiring thing. I have him meet Sri Yukteswar, but I don't have any of the life with Sri Yukteswar because I wanted people to see that Master was a great soul in his own right. He wasn't just this humble little student who came to these, these uh, um, great saints. They were, he told me, they were, uh, he, wanted, he wanted to ask them questions. Even when he was a little child, they were asking him questions. And he faded out of the picture. But if you do a story of him, you can't have him fading out. You have to show his greatness. You can't give the impression which his own book gives that, well, if he did it, I can. It's beautiful in him, but it wouldn't be beautiful if I talked that way. And it wouldn't be, um, it wouldn't be true. Arjuna did the same thing in writing uh, in, in the dialogue in the Bhagavad Gita. And he also comes as a humble devotee trying to learn at the feet of Krishna. But in fact, he was Krishna's equal. They were both one with God. So Master, in his own life, um, it, was, it was very different from what, really he was a great master playing the role of a humble devotee to give us the feeling that we could do it too. So when I write a movie about him, it has to be a different type. And so I don't show him as a humble student of Sri Yukteswar. He was equal to, in greatness to Sri Yukteswar. And uh, so I end with that. And where <coughs> um, Jitenda, um, when they come to Calcutta, you remember that story where Master is going to go to, to uh, uh, see, to see his guru in Zerampur. And Jitenda says, well, you go, I, I want to go to be with my family for a while. And Master speaks about his being fickle and so on. I have Jitenda say, I am just not a racehorse like you. So that's the end of part one. Then in part two, I tell stories that uh, were from uh, here in America. And some of those stories are beautiful and stories that people don't know. For example, in Encinitas, he had a group of guests there and uh, he wanted to serve carrot juice from the processing plant in Encinitas. But uh, the monk came and said they only had a glass full, not enough for the 12 or so guests. So Master said, bring it anyway. So he brought it, and no matter how many glasses they filled, it still was in the original pitcher. So he just kept creating it, and the guests didn't know. But this was Master's way. There's a beautiful story in that book and in that movie. Um, the book, when did I? I don't remember. Anyway, it's in the movie about Master driving with Devi Mukherjee and a few others down the street. And he suddenly said, stop the car, stop the car. And he walked back to this uh, little sort of curiosity shop, junk shop in a way, and he picked up a number of items, and Debbie was wondering, what on earth does he want with that stuff? And when he paid the amount, the lady proprietress, she burst into tears. She said, I very badly needed this much money today, and it was closing time, and I was almost losing hope. And she said, you saved me. So, so many really beautiful stories. He couldn't put it in his own book, but this is going to make, I think, a beautiful movie. And what I want to say is that a number of people here in Hollywood are excited about making this into a movie. We have a director, we have uh, quite a few people who want to do this. And then the answer 
is about my life seeking truth and finally finding Master. And then it too has stories about living with Master and what it was like and so on. And uh, it starts in a fictional way also. I'm not that Jesus visiting Babaji is fictional. But in this one, uh, it starts with a lady banging on a door and uh, saying, Swami, Swami, please help, please. And then you see the light come on and you see the front door opening. I'm putting on my, my uh, bathrobe and, and asking him to come in. So I'll have to be in this movie at my age because much of it is going back to those times. Well, this is nice too for us because as the screenwriter, I get, I think, $80,000. And I never take money for myself, so it will be used for helping to build our, our work here. And uh, this, of course, pleases me very much. We'll have a lot of extras, and anybody who wants to serve as an extra, they, if they say one word, they have to be paid 2500 If they only, if they don't say anything, they get paid 250 so anyway, <laughs> these, these are all good. And uh, then there's, there is another one. We have uh, somebody here working on both movies. The other one, Nandini, was right here. <laughs> and she has a particular power. It's extraordinary. I remember one time I was in India and I telephoned to Kitani and Anand, who are in charge of our work in Italy. And I said to them, really, I'm too ill. I can't come this year. Forgive me. And Nandini was there. And she took the phone and said, would you like to launch uh, uh, Religion in the New Age? Wasn't that it? And uh, would you like to launch that in Milan? That's all she said. I said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Not many people can get me to change my mind like that. Anyway, wherever she goes, she meets these extraordinary people. So she's brought, we, ha we have a, there's a community up in Ojai. How she ever met them, I don't know. But uh, the founder of it, I think, would make a very good me about the age of 30. And uh, the, there's another man he brought with him who was an Indian heritage but born in Canada. And he could make a very good Yogananda. So we're anyway, we're, we're working hard to get these films made quickly. And I've done a, an hour recording to try to raise funds for the, the uh, one for Master, The Way Shower, I'm calling it. And the other movie about me is called The Answer. This mother and her son who were about to come, who was about, she, she said that, she went into his room and he had a gun at his head. And she said, she saved him, just came in the moment of time. And she said to him, why did you do this? And he said, that what's the use of living? Everybody has proved that life has no meaning. What's the use of living, a meaningless life? And he goes on in this way. Sartre has proved that there's no, there are no moral values. Darwin has proved that there's no meaning and evolution and so on and so on. And then I say, well, it might be good because I had some of these doubts myself. It might be good to know some of my life. And uh, so from then on, the movie has him um, and then more people and more people sitting and asking me questions and so on. So that part I have to do at my age. Then the parts which show me as a young man, this ma young man can do. And the Yogananda might, he might well be the same man for the way shower. That's not up to me, but we have a director for uh, both movies. So it's really moving along. And another, mo another thing that happened to me just a few months ago, I sort of in an idle moment picked up uh, The Wizard of Oz, thinking to read it. And I got only as far as the yellow brick road when all of a sudden this inspiration came to me to write a children's story. And believe it or not, I sat down immediately and the whole thing was handed to me as if on a platter. I didn't even have to think. In two weeks, 
I wrote 180 pages. And uh, it really is a fun story. I do urge you to get it out here. What it is is me at the age of nine, I'm called Donnie, and my brother is younger. His name is Bobby, with the real, there were real people, obviously. And they're in Timis, as you know, I was born and brought up in Romania of American parents. And uh, we went out into the Transylvanian forest and in the mountains, the Carpathian Mountains. And we came upon a ruin of a laboratory. And uh, nobody knew about this. It was kept a strict secret. But it was a ruin. And they went inside, and they found it uh, an, a file cabinet that had been forced open. And they opened it up, and it turned out that they, they read something um, in in German, but then it, I give the translated words. Of course, I know German. And uh, so they, uh, it said that time is not a straight line from past to present to future. You are in the center of it, and time moves around you. And uh, if you can go into timelessness, you can travel in time. Anyway, I'm abbreviating it very much, but they, they go out into the, outside the thing into the forest around there and they're sitting there and they see this huge skeleton and they go over and look at this thing and it, it's a skeleton of a dinosaur and they wonder how did that get here and they look closely and they see that some of the meat of the dinosaur is still there it has been eaten that means it was a recent thing and they think how did this happen so anyway they go into the into the laboratory again and uh, then they read more about time. Then they go into another room in the back. And in this room, there's a tunnel. They go into the tunnel, and uh, they go down. And first of all, it's very scary because they're becoming smaller and smaller and smaller. But they realize that they're still conscious, and they turn to go back. They're terrified, but they can't get back. There's some sort of a power that keeps them moving forward. And in, in this, they see themselves shrinking, and they see that uh, dust is becoming huge boulders. And then um, they go a little further, and the puddle on the floor becomes a lake. And they see Paramecia floating around in there. And they get still smaller, and they see atoms, and they begin to look like planets and stars and so on. And they go a little further, and finally they f become nothing, physically. They're still aware. But then they suddenly find themselves surrounded by a sphere of light. And this is when you can get rid of your sense of ego, then you achieve wisdom. And you can go beyond time into timelessness. Well, they found themselves coming out at the other end of the tunnel, suddenly in their normal bodies surrounded by this zero of light, a sphere of light. And they see a man lying on the ground there, and they say to him, but they say, well, he, they manage to go over to him in their time light sphere and call to him. He doesn't hear them. Then he says, what's that dinosaur doing out there? As soon as he hears the word dinosaur, he wakes up, he's panic stricken. He said, what happened, what happened? And uh, they say that they've seen this dinosaur and he's terrified that this dinosaur, which he knew about, is ravaging the countryside. And they say, no, no, don't worry, it's dead. And so um, he explains to them what happened, that his father had died. His father invented this and he worked with his father. And after his father died, he did a lot of time traveling. And one time he went back to the time 64 million years ago when dinosaurs were around. And <coughs> there's a, one thing that he'd discovered. His father had taken him forward and uh, he, um, he discovered that as, you ha as there's a sound barrier that an airplane makes and it goes beyond the sound barrier, you all know about that. There's also a time barrier. 
And his father said, be careful never to start too quickly because you'll break through the sound barrier, that, the ti time barrier that way, and it'll cause a, an explosion. And so he was on this, this dinosaur. He got to the plane and went. Uh, he decided he wanted to ride, so he came out of his time life sphere. And the story teaches you how to create this time light sphere with your hands and how to scroll it down again. And uh, anyway, he is on this thing when suddenly a Tyrannosaurus Rex comes charging out. And the Tyrannosaurus Rex doesn't even think of him. He's sort of like a flea to the Tyrannosaurus Rex, but he's attacking his ride. And in panic to get out of that place, he creates his time light sphere rushes out, but he doesn't create it perfectly. And he goes much too quickly, and there's a huge explosion back at the tunnel, which is the, how he entered timelessness. And there he is, the explosion occurs, and the dinosaur is thrown forward and through the tunnel. And the reason it can go through the tunnel is because it shrinks until it expands again. And then the, the uh, um, young man is thrown backwards and he's been lying on the ground there just uh, stunned and not wholly conscious and he said what year is this and they said 1935 he said oh my god and I went I, this happened to me five years ago in 1930 and here I am suddenly finding myself in uh, um, five years later and I've been unconscious all this time, but there's been no time. It's been timeless. So anyway, then from there on, he, he begins to explore with the two boys. His name is Hansel, and there's a Johnny and Bobby, and they <coughs> go backwards in time. And they go to the time of Vlad Dracul. A Dracul Dracula is actually, means devil in Romanian. And... Uh, <coughs> They go back to that time and see some horrible ways the Dracula treated people in there. So he says, hey, we don't, no, we're not so sure. We like traveling this way. And then they go to time of William Tell. And they see William Tell shooting the apple and then turning and shooting Gessler. And uh, <coughs> then another scene in Switzerland where the uh, um, peasants are. revolting and the aristocrats are coming to attack them and get them under control again. So they arrive, this is supposed to have happened, um, they arrive at the scene late at night and uh, that night the peasants flood a field and overnight it turns to ice. And when these aristocrats come out they get onto that field and start slipping and falling and they can't, they're helpless in their armor, lying there on this ice. And the peasants can come in and kill them all, which they did. So Donnie says, well, why can't we go back and show these people in Romania in the time of Vlad Dracul um, how to be more creative in their, in their oppression? And uh, Hansel says, we can't do that. That's the way they were dreaming then. And... Uh, <coughs> He says, we can't change history, but ch history can change us. We can learn from history important lessons. And uh, so then they go to many other periods. From there, they go back to the time of Egypt. And you know, one thing about a children's story is that it's wonderful in that it gives you an opportunity to fantasize in such a way that you can offer people truths that you believe but can't prove. So the book is full of teaching, and one of them is with Egypt. They, they talk about the pyramids being created by slave labor. And I said, no culture that would create something so highly sophisticated as a pyramid could think of having slaves. It would be un impossible. And I said that, uh, or somebody says that, Hansel probably, that uh, they, nowadays many 
Um, scholars are thinking that that pyramid was not built for Khufu as a tomb for one man. And in fact, these are true things. Much of what I've said is actually true. They've found that there is, they've never found a body in that supposed uh, uh, crypt, the tomb in the uh, sarcophagus. They've never found a lid for it. They've never found any offerings of uh, food or any, anything, nothing. Been completely empty. And there's a shaft up from that king's chamber up to the outside so it brings the air through. And I came up with a completely different theory which I think is delightful. I said it's absurd to have this as a tomb. There's no sign of it being a tomb. Moreover, the sarcophagus itself. I've lain in that sarcophagus. You really feel the flower there. And uh, the sarcophagus is uh, carved out of a single piece of stone and so expertly carved we don't have the equipment even today to carve it. And so I offered an alternate suggestion. I said that it was really built, there's a king's chamber and a queen's chamber. And this is something else that, that uh, people have discovered, that the, um, th the pyramid, the great pyramid, is really the geographic center of the earth. Don't ask me to justify it, because frankly I don't know. But many people have said so, so I say fine. Anyway, what these, what these, what I said is that these, these uh, priests and priestess go to that place, and uh, they lie in this sarcophagus, and we know today that a pyramid shape creates power. So they lie in this pyramid, and uh, send out blessings to the whole world. Isn't that a much more beautiful explanation? But I couldn't put it in an ordinary book. Or is it a book for children? I can do it. <laughs> so it's really, it's great fun. I think grown-ups and their grandparents will enjoy it even more than children. But actually, everybody who's read this book has found it delightful. I just read it, and I, I was just as delighted again. <laughs> <laughs> and children, too, have liked it. Children as young as seven years old. Because I present the philosophy in a, a way that's completely absorbable. And uh, so then they go to, from uh, um, Egypt, they go back to Atlantis. And it's very interesting. Um, people say that Atlantis never was, but um, I believe it was. Master said it was. And there are all sorts of books on the subject trying to prove or disprove or say it's in Rhodes or it's in this part or it's up in Scandinavia. They have all sorts of ideas. But I had an idea that many of the towns in Mexico end in Atlan. Mazatlan, Tepozatlan, about 10 different towns in Mexico have the name either Atlan or Tlan. It's the sound that you don't have in other languages. Even the word Atlantic, where does it come from? There's no, there's no, as far as I know, there isn't any language. So I've said that Atlantis is connected with Mexico. It was in the middle of the Atlantic. And Egypt also had its power derived from Atlantis. You know, another thing about the Egyptian culture is that there's no sign of a rise to that level. They've, they only know the peak and coming down from that peak. So the thought has been that Egypt is actually a colony of Atlantis. And I think that's quite a feasible theory. So anyway, they go to Atlantis and they find fascinating things. Cars that move two inches above the ground, completely soundless. They have millions of tiny crystals in the roof which uh, draw energy to the cars and keep them moving as they do, so there's no motor. Everything is soundless. And they don't have traffic lights and all that because the streets go one way on one level, the other way on the other level. And uh, it's full of all sorts of fascinating things. They don't have any trouble with insects because covering the entire 
city is a huge dome and they keep the atmosphere always a certain level. Insects are kept out. And they meet a woman called Bess Mrs. Bessintlan and she takes them into a shop. And uh, there they find clothing that is sort of like liquid. You don't have to dress it and have buttons and all that. Just folds around your body. And uh, um, the colors are absolutely beautiful in the clothing. Then she takes them up to a uh, little toy shop. And there's what Donnie, Bobby calls an air scooter. You get onto it and you, you uh, can suddenly move through the air, not touching anything. And the whole th thing of it is that uh, um, he does it and it h hits a wall, but the wall gives. There's no pain involved. All the structures are flexible. So you don't have any smashing and so on. Lots of things of that nature. And then they find another place where, um, oh, when they want to change, they just go to a place, press a button, and suddenly a wall of light forms around them. So they're completely private. No one can see in. They can see out. No one can see in. And uh, uh, Donnie then finds a tower where this light is, goes up and he sees colors all around him. And uh, he's thrilled with that. Now there's one story which I'm, I'm writing this into a movie also, but uh, this isn't in the book, it will be. This is a temporary edition, a reader's co only copy. But in the final edition, Mrs. Bessie Dlan takes them over to a counter of dancing bears. And it's quite fun because these bears have uh, sort of stereophonic music coming out of their insides. And uh, there's one that is a ballet dancer. And so they have this bear with the beautiful ballet music coming out of its belly. And uh, it's absolutely ridiculous to see this fat bear doing all these graceful movements. <laughs> 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 and there's another <coughs> bear. What is that one? Which? Oh, yes, there's another flamenco sound. And you have these fat bears with this thump, thump, you know. <laughs> and it's pure comedy. Anyway, then uh, they go to her home. And anyway, it's a fascinating story. But you see that the problem with, with uh, Atlantis is that they wanted power. They didn't think about working with nature. They thought of conquering nature. And this is why they fell eventually, according to tradition. And so you have that negative aspect. So um, then they go um, to Syracuse. And it talks about Plato, first of all, and how his Plato, I think, is a bomb. Everybody praises him. And what I did as a child, I proved to myself that reason is not the way to find truth. Plato boxes you in with questions forces you to accept his conclusion, because reason leads to this conclusion. But a thing can be, de can be um, amazingly right, but damnably be wrong. You can't trust reason. It has to have the endorsement of your heart. And so Plato dreamed up this society in the Republic. And the, the uh, ruler of Syracuse actually invited him, this is history, invited him to come and create his republic. And it was an absolute disaster. And still people praise Plato, b although the only experiment that his teachings have been submitted to is that one in Syracuse. Anyway, the three of them go to Syracuse and they see it's an absolutely cold, rational, no heart, no feeling for anybody. And uh, they decide they don't like to be there very long. And so they leave there. Then they go back to Diogenes. And Diogenes has been, there are lots of stories, not all of them pleasant, but he's, he's either considered to be or whatever. Anyway, our Diogenes is a truly wise man. And uh, the king, Ale uh, Alexander, Emperor Alexander, this is supposed to be a true story, he came to him and asked him, um, 
you've done, you're such a great, wise man. I would like to do something for you. And uh, he's, you know, Diogenes says, well, what can you give me that I would want? He says, I can give you a beautiful residence. I can give you all sorts of things. Diogenes says, there's only one favor you can do. Your shadow is on me. Would you move a little to the right? <laughs> And there's another story which I haven't told about Diogenes that um, somebody came to him, so I'm eating nothing but lentil soup. And he said, if you would flatter the emperor, you would get all sorts of riches and things. And he said, if Diogenes replied, if I didn't flatter the uh, emperor, um, I, if, I, if I, let's see, if I didn't flatter the emperor, I, w I would get, what was the story? If you didn't flatter the emperor, you wouldn't have to eat lentils. That's right. You wouldn't have to eat lentils if I didn't flatter. And, and then Diogenes replies, if you would learn to eat lentils, you wouldn't have to flatter the emperor. Yeah, that's right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the time with Diogenes is very interesting because he answers many questions about life and truth and so on. So then I go to um, the future, way into the future, into Satya Yuga, and they meet a man who, and again, I have a lot of fun with uh, certain things that you wouldn't have in this time zone. But he also gives very deep but engaging answers to questions about life. And then the final one is a, three, a thousand years in the future. And uh, there he, he, uh, they they um, find a village, and utopia means no place. But I call this village Eutopia. Eu in Greek means uh, beautiful, beautiful place. And the village is that, and it, it shows again uh, a beautiful society, more realistic in our terms, is closer to our times. And there... There's a dog. I, c I was amazed. I asked Master what name I should give this dog, and the name came back, Rookfort. <laughs> and so I, that's the name of this dog. Anyway, um, he goes, uh, the Hansel finds this girl, Jennifer, who's a very sort of down-to-earth girl. And uh, he goes with her to a school, and there... Um, this, the woman, the teacher is giving a uh, discussion from history of how Lord Nelson was lying on the battlefield, severely wounded, and uh, they brought him some water, and there was a soldier, a common soldier, lying on the ground next to him, ready to, be, to die. And uh, um, Lord Nelson insisted that the water be given to this soldier, and people said, why? And he said, his need is greater than mine. So um, the teacher then asks the students, what does this story tell you? And they said, well, it's um, um, giving is more uh, glorious and so on. So Hansel says, would you like, would you allow me to ask a question? He said, you've asked a question about ancient history. I'd like to ask you, is there some volunteer? So a little girl called Rachel volunteers. And he said, what is your favorite food? Well, I've mentioned Astral Strudel in the beginning. So I, I say, have her say, oh, Apfel Strudel. And he says, imagine your mother giving you Apfel Strudel for lunch. And then you see a boy in the school weeping his heart out, some pain that he's endured, that somebody's treated him badly, whatever it is. Would you be willing to comfort him by giving a little bit of that apple strudel. First, she, she said, would you like to share that apple strudel? She said, no. But when he gives her this example, then he says, well, of course I'd give him some. Then he asked a further question. What if you felt that, um, is she, is she, is she, is she, what is it? Anyway, she, he said, uh, you, y would you be willing? No, she said, would you be willing to help him? with a little bit of it, and she reasoned it out, and she said, well, I wouldn't, uh, 
I would enjoy the apple strudel, but once it was gone, it would be gone. Whereas if I give to him, I could help him, and he'd be happy, and I might make a friend. And I, I, she said, yes, I certainly think that's more important than having this apple strudel for lunch. Then the Hansel asked her further, would you be willing to give all your apple strudel? She struggles a bit with that, but she realizes that his friendship would mean much more to her than the brief taste of apple strudel. And so he shows that you can, if you, can, if you teach children from example, not from theory, that they can learn much more deeply. So Jennifer, this, this uh, girl, is very pleased with the way he teaches. And anyway, he ends up, um, they end up wanting to get married so that he can stay there. You can't change your time zone in history, but there's one exception, love. And because he, is, he loves her, he can change his time zone from where he is to the present. And uh, so the boys, um, anyway, they come into the room and uh, Bobby says, I, I uh, smen smell something here. And Donnie says, yes, molasses. Too uh, s sweet but sticky. And so that was his comment on their marriage. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway, they do stay and get married, and Bobby and Donnie come back to the 1935. And uh, then I ask the question, do they ever go back? And uh, they say, uh, the answer is no, they couldn't, because in 1930, the, the they had to be sent to England to school. And then they went to America in 1939, Hitler invaded Poland for many years. They couldn't um, go back. Donnie grew up, and he's never had a chance to go back. But would you like to? <laughs> anyway, I think you'll really enjoy that book. I just finished it again, and I've, I'm writing a movie for that, too. And I think it could be a bestseller, both as a book. It hasn't come out yet, and uh, we only have advanced copies, I said, but uh, as a movie. And I haven't yet finished the movie, but um, I'm at the point of, I think it's Diogenes, so I'm well into it. I haven't much farther to go. And I th anyway, that's what I've been doing in my free time here. And uh, I, I, that's part of my reason for being here. It's not as if we hope. Many people are really desirous of putting on the way shore. And uh, Nandini is here to put on the answer. And uh, uh, it looks like these things are actually going to happen. So that's another reason for my being here. Anyway, would I would also like to give you an opportunity to ask questions if you would like. And how is Nam Devi? Nice to see you. So, any questions? Yeah. I'm deaf as a post, so. Have you thought of the say? Green Tunnel as a children's TV show with every week a different episode? I have. I think it's a great idea, but I'm not able to materialize it. I think it will become a TV show in time because it would be perfect for that. And they could invent all sorts of other episodes so it could run a long time. But it's an aspect I'm, I don't, I never watch TV and it just, I don't know. But it's a great idea. Any other questions? Okay. What's this? No, anything. What's she saying? I'd like to hear your thoughts on destiny versus free choice. Are you in favor of 
This is a very important question. When I first got those prophecies from Brigu, written thousands of years ago, giving me my name, giving me my country, saying he has two brothers but no sister is possible, the one sister, the sister, there will be one sister but she will die in his mother's womb. And I went back to America. When I went back, I asked my mother if she had ever had a miscarriage. She said, yes, one. And uh, things for the future, it's incredible how accurate it has been. It said at one point, I've given him the fruits of his good karma, now here are the fruits of some of his bad karma. And he said there's a danger of sudden death. And uh, in fact, I was out at 29 Palms, and suddenly one, one afternoon on a walk, I had a flock of crows flying around my head. And I thought, this has to be a bad omen. Two, two days later, I packed everything up to go back to Los Angeles, where I lived. And uh, as I, I would been, I'd been sleeping out on the terrace. And when I took my sheets apart, I found a squashed black widow spider between the sheets. So that's not a, uh, the sort of thing that... Anyway, I was saved from that. Then another time, I was in Puri, and I was setting up the microphone for Master's birthday, January 5th. And uh, it was, Diamata was going to speak, and I was setting up the microphone for her, and suddenly that whole 230 volts went through my body. And here I was grasping the microphone. There's just nothing you can do in that case. Your hands are frozen. And uh, it lifted me off the ground. And in that split instant, the fuse blew. So it took me about half an hour to find a new fuse, but my life was spared. My heart was sort of not very happy for a few days, but <laughs> at least my life was spared. And the third time, I had bought a lambretta. You know what those are, motor scooters in, Switzerland, in Italy. And uh, I sipped it to India. And I was visiting in Sultan Singh building in Old Delhi. And uh, there was a large courtyard with a brick wall around it. And I took this thing out of its case when it arrived. And I tried turning the key just to see what happened. And it was in, in gear. And the moment I turned the key, it took off at a high speed for a brick wall. And I managed to find out what to do about it, getting it. Uh, in neutral and putting my foot on the brake, I stopped that close to the brake wall. I'd have certainly been killed at that speed. So three times in my life, my karma um, would have killed me, but I, I was spared that. And he spoke about other bad karmas also, which have come true. And uh, everything it said really has come true. It said he will return to his country in uh, two months. And in fact, I returned in two months. And it said that when he returns, his brothers and sisters will welcome him very lovingly, and they did. And on the way back, I got a telegram or something saying that Dr. Lewis had died. And when I returned, they put me on the board and made me the vice president of SRS. <coughs> and uh, many things it said that True. It didn't speak at all about my dismissal from SRF, as if that was just a trivial incident in my life. To me, subjectively, it was a very important incident. But uh, in fact, it was a great blessing, because it released me to do the things that Master himself had told me to do. So anyway, I don't look on it as a misfortune, though at the time it was devastating. So anyway, the question naturally arises, how could somebody 5,000 years ago foresee these things, and then what does that do to free will? Well, the fact is, what it really is, we have misunderstood free will. Free will does not mean being able to do something completely unexpected. Free will is the freedom to do that which is best for you or not. Free will is to the freedom to do, to seek God or reject him. Basically, that is all the free will we have. 
Sri Yukteswar told Master, as we see in autobiography of a yogi, how he would be having strawberries with cream and Master would like it. And this was years before he came to America. How could anybody know such a thing? How are prophecies possible? It's because you do not have free will. You do not have free will in the choice of your tie this morning. Of course, nobody wears ties anymore. <laughs> but I'm an old fogey, and I know that feeling. I used to dread being choked to death by a tie. <laughs> and so, um, how is it that possible? Because it can, it can, pre it is known. God is omniscient, and He wouldn't be omniscient if these things were unknowable. How does He know these things? Because He knows that that, uh, that morning you will have this kind of feeling, and in fact, you are a prisoner in this body and don't know it. You think I do it because I like to. The fact is, what makes you like it? There's the whole key. What makes you like to live in Los Angeles? What makes you like to go here and do that? What makes you like to put on this kind of clothing? You walk, you drive by on Hollywood Boulevard and you see some pretty weird characters. What makes them want to be like that? Well, all of these things are, they're known. And it's known when. Karma is an extremely subtle and uh, all-encompassing law. Every time you breathe, you're using, you're doing something that sets a motion in the universe. And wherever, see, God is without movement. But wherever he creates movement, it's like waves. Every upward wave has to be compensated for by a downward wave. So every pleasure has to be followed by a pain. Bliss is the only thing that has no opposite. But when you become happy, you know that you're going to have to have some other thing. Years ago, somebody gave me a motorhome. I had always wanted a motorhome. And I am usually very even-minded, but this time I let myself go. And I laughed gleefully. And I knew in my mind that I'll have to pay for this, but I don't care. <laughs> I really <laughs> like this motorhome. And so I was sat back and laughed and laughed all that same evening. When your karma is pretty clear, you're, it comes to you very quickly. It's not delayed. So that very evening, um, Vidura, he's sitting here, <laughs> he stopped the motorhome in a Safeway parking lot and went back to get something from the refrigerator. He didn't notice it was in gear and the motorhome was moving very slowly <laughs> so that you couldn't feel it. And I was perched on the seat with the knee on the seat and my foot on the floor, reaching up into a cupboard to get something when it hit the wall. And although it didn't damage the wall at all, it, uh, and it didn't damage the motorhome, it threw me on the floor and I broke a finger. And I laughed and laughed. I said, this is the natural compensation. But everything you do, you will have to experience it opposite. Therefore, don't get too excited about things. When you see people on, in television ads jumping up and down, that kind of pleasure will have a hangover. <laughs> Can't be avoided. So the truth is we don't have free will. The only free will we have is the power to love God and seek him or to reject him. Nothing else is free, not at all free. So the real definition of free will is not the ability to do something completely unanticipated, unexpected, but the freedom to move in the right direction that will give you happiness and harmony. And uh, that, in other words, true freedom is only in God. When you can find God, then you find that freedom. So when you live according to the spiritual law, you become freer and freer. And even when things happen to you, when you reach the state of Jivan Mukta, then 
alone are you free. This is why I didn't like, don't like the SRF version of the Bhagavad Gita because it said that about samadhi. In early samadhi there's still a memory of having been Joe Brown. And when you come back to your body, which from Sabhikalpa you do, then you take on the same qualities you had before. And in that state you can fall. Another thing I didn't like in that book is it talks about the gunas and it says that here's what you can do if you have if you are tamasic by nature. Tamasic means dark, dull. Um, um, there are three qualities. I don't need to go into all that right now. But it said, here's what you can do if you are tamasic. Well, the answer to that is, the problem with that answer is that tamasic people, one thing that marks them is their total indifference to change. So I give them that advice. Really, the only way for tamasic people to be helped is to be in the presence of somebody who is um, more evol evolved than they. The whole caste system has a very lofty meaning because it isn't based on wh uh, wh wh who you are and where you're born. It isn't what your father did. It's for the individual. And the individual can also change his caste. As it says in the Gita, that even the worst of sinners can find me if he steadfastly meditates on me. But a tamasic person is basically ruled by laziness and uh, <laughs> dullness of mind. Then as the mind begins to evolve, it begins to think in terms of what's in it for me. Like that Charlotte's Web, what's in it for me, Charlotte? That one. And uh, then uh, that's the merchant kind of consciousness. But it didn't mean it was only merchants. People who have that consciousness. Then, as they call them in India, Pakabanyas. Um, then, as you evolve further, you begin to think, well, I'm not happy when I think only of myself. I would like to help other people. And so that's the true kshatriya. Somebody who wants to help other people and uh, thinks in terms of, uh, he's, I, he's typified as a soldier, but that's because a soldier is willing to lay down his life for the protection of his country. So the true kshatriya doesn't have to be a soldier at all, but he has to be somebody who's thinking of others rather than himself. And in the highest caste, the Brahmin is one who realizes that doing things for people isn't really going to give them what they want. Only God could give them that. So the Brahmin is one who knows that the only thing he can do for others really is to help them to know God. So those are the really real meanings of the caste system. But the SRF version of the Bhagavad Gita gives the tamasic person, a way to get out of his tamas. That's not what Master wrote. I was with him when he was doing the writing. But it's a complete impossibility. The only way for a tamasic person to become better is to perhaps be a servant in the home of a merchant. That kind of thing. So that the influence of others gradually lifts him out of that. So anyway, that answers your question at some length. Yes. If you're on my left side, I'll hear you better. Did Yogananda talk simple and down to earth like you, or no? He talked like me. And he talked with great humor. And uh, it was a sheer delight listening to him. He had a strong Bengali accent. And he wasn't always easy to understand. But he had wonderful humor. And uh, yes, he talked like me. Except that I don't have to. He had to, he had to have his words edited. Fortunately, I don't. So I never let anybody touch my books with an editorial pen. But, but uh, he had to have that. Because he wasn't perfect in English. He was not a scholar not at all a scholar, and yet amazingly, he couldn't have read these things. And yet I am something of a scholar. And as I look back through history, I see that his teachings address every single problem that has come up over the 2,000 
years of Christianity, from the Aryan heresy on down through the, all of them, he answers every one of them. It's just amazing to me to see how he has drawn together the highest teachings of all the religions and shown how everything is one. He said that someday people will understand that the only religion is self-realization. And that does not mean self-realization fellowship. It means that people will realize that they themselves are uh, made in the image of God, that the goal of life is to become one with God. And uh, he was absolutely incredible in his knowledge because he was always, as the English would say, spot on. He, he, he knew the things that a scholar would take great pride in knowing, and he tossed it off casually. He'd never read it, but he knew it. It was really quite an amazing experience to be with him, especially for somebody like me, because I, I had been intellectual and I had studied a great deal. And I found that nothing he ever said did not get it was not a corroboration of a truth that most people don't even know, don't even dream exists. So another question? Was he very playful? He was playful, not very playful. He could be, for example, because I was intellectual, when I'd been with him a month, he had me out at the desert retreat, and uh, he, um, I remember he had us in the kitchen, turned out the lights, and he had a paper bag, and I heard a little ruffling, and then finally, bzz, 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 one of those little guns that shoot sparks. <laughs> and he looked at me, and he said, what do you think of it, Walter? I said, it's fine, sir. I had thought of this sage as being somebody very serious, and here he was playing with it. Then he shot at another one, and a parachute went up, and we walked solemnly as it descended to earth. And I, I was trying to put it all together, because I, I wanted to understand things. So um, he, I said, what do you think of it, Walter? I said, well, it's fine, sir. Then he said, suffer little children to come unto God, to come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. And he said that it's true that a wise man is like a child, not childish, but totally unprejudiced, accepting of everything. And you notice these wise men, like this Sri Rama Yogi, whom I met, whom Master told me, I, he was fully liberated. The only one outside the saints, uh, the line of gurus, and the two disciples of Larry Mashe. He said all the others, Ananda Moima, um, all these others, they're great souls. It's not that they're anything less, but they're Jivan Moktas, which means they still have past karma they're working on. <coughs> and uh, so Sri Rama Yogi, he was very solemn, but you look into his eyes and there was a twinkle there. And you know he was the same, but Master was very outward. That one wonderful thing about Master was that he was completely human, but in a completely beautiful way. He didn't show the human faults, but he showed what humanity can become. And in this, I have never met a saint so human as he. And uh, yes, he, he was playful in sometimes, but he was also very solemn in other times. I always, I have to say, I always held him in awe. Even though he could be playful like this, I really just felt that I'm in the presence of an incredible level of greatness. And I just, I, I could never be playful with him. And uh, I could never presume. When I met Ananda Moi Ma, she was like my mother. And I could be close to her in that way. With Master, I could not be. I was just too, as I say, in, in awe of him. But I was deeply inspired always. And sometimes he'd be talking about something to do with maybe filling the potholes in the driveway or something. And I, who wasn't involved in that work, would just close my eyes and I'd feel these waves of bliss. So he could be, if, if 
if he wanted to be serious, then nobody could shake him from that seriousness. But if he wanted to be playful, he could be, and in a perfectly charming way, like what I told you about that story this morning of the dogs that he put in a gunny sock and the way he laughed about it and so on. Um, he was absolutely lovable, but there was this one aspect of his, he was still such a great man that I, I could perceive that he was so far above me that I, I couldn't break through that one. I hope someday that will change, but I don't mind that it is. He was my guru, and uh, as my guru, I take him as he is and learn from him. I found that everything he said to me was right and genuine. Every advice he gave me, sometimes I complained. For once, for instance, for example, I was too intellectual, and he wanted to break me of this. And uh, he kept talking about it, get devotion, get devotion. And uh, then he gave me a job of writing. And I thought, here he wants me not to be intellectual, he's forcing me to be intellectual. And I became upset with him. And I remember he, he said that when you were <coughs> living for God is martyrdom. And it seemed like a strange definition of martyrdom, but I found he was right. It didn't mean that being devotional meant losing my brains. It meant that you balance it with devotion. And so in following his advice, I developed much more devotion than I would have done if I had tried to suppress my intellect. So in fact, I found that as his disciples, my mind has become much clearer than it was before. I would look when I wanted to write at a page and just not know what to say. And I gave up writing partly for that reason. I wanted to write truth and I didn't know truth. But now it's amazing to me I don't think anybody has ever asked me a question to which I didn't have a very good answer. And it isn't that I have that answer, but I suddenly understand. The attunement with him, I've had insights into so many things that nobody's ever been able to stump me with a question. It's as if he gave me the answer. It's just incredible. But I have to say that if you want to do something well in this world, don't do it. Let him do it through you, and you'll find the clarity coming to you that will absolutely stun you sometimes. Sometimes I think, gee, I wish I had not thought of that one. And it came out, the answer came out of my own mouth. But I listen to myself saying these things, and I think, where did that come from? Of course I know the answer. But I remember once in Hollywood Church, I remember that Master had said that, uh, um, you should let God talk through you. So one time in the middle of a sermon, I thought, well, let me see if it works th this way. So I stopped talking. And you know, this room holds about 100 people, a little more. And uh, standing there for two minutes saying nothing is uh, quite a thing when an audience is waiting for you to say the next word. And some people were perspiring, <laughs> thinking I'd frozen with fear. But in fact, I was just comfortably waiting for God to say something. And after two minutes, I realized he wasn't going to say anything. Then I understood, I have to do it, but I have to ask him for inspiration. And his master said, I will reason, I will will, I will act, but guide thou my reason, will, and activity to the right path in everything. So we have to do what we understand. If we make a mistake, we're quickly shown that it is a mistake, and we're bound to make mistakes in life. But if we have that wish for him to guide us, gradually he will show us the right way. So let him be the doer. Master said, even when you sin, think he did it. Now that seems like a, uh, an excuse, doesn't it? But he said, God likes that because that way he can change you. If you give him the blame rather than the credit, then he will be able to gradually change your consciousness 
Can you reach the point where, in fact, no fault that you might have is you? And once you overcome that fault, you marvel that you ever had it. It seems so uninteresting to you. And uh, you'll change in ways that you won't recognize yourself someday. You, whoever you are, are as great as Jesus Christ in potential. Jesus re recognized it. You have yet to understand it. And I remember Master told me to grow a beard. In those days, nobody was wearing beards. Somebody saw me on the streets and called out, Fidel Castro! <laughs> 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 and because of this beard, I guess, somebody urged me to d be a part of a Masonic Lodge uh, initiation thing for his officers. And they wanted me to play Jesus at Gethsemane. And really, I didn't do anything. I sat at this rock and sighed a few times, and leaned over the rock and came up and sighed. And pretty absurd. Anyway, ma Master later asked me how did it go, and I said, well, sir, you it was a disaster, wasn't it? I said, yes, it was. They was in the meeting there. Half the officers got upset, walked out, and all sorts of nonsense. And then, but Master said, a number of people said that you looked like Jesus Christ. And I said to Master, inevitably, well, I'd rather be like him than look like him. And the thing that made it beautiful was Master's answer. He said, quite casually, that will come. That will come to all of us. He saw us all as our spiritual potential. And he wasn't working with uh, Tom Jones. He was working with Tom Jones, the saint. His potential, which is different in every person, he was working with that potential to help bring out the goodness in him. And he saw everybody as potentially a uh, perfect soul in God. There was a wonderful thing that happened to me in Florence, Italy, last year. I woke up w after a dream, and uh, I wanted very much to write it down. I didn't find any, p any paper in my bag. There was no, usually a hotel room will have note paper. There was nothing. And uh, all I found was a little paper doily under a glass. I pulled that out, and I wrote this little thing. But I said that everybody in the world is seeking only one thing, bliss. And everybody is expressing that wish in a different way, that bliss which Master defined absolutely beautifully. We hear the expression, Satchitananda is ever existing, ever conscious, ever new bliss, and we pass over it. We don't stop to think how very important that thought is, ever new. Everybody seeks God in a different way, but it's always bliss. And then this, well, I wrote this down because I just had a dream in which I saw all these different people, grouchy, old, mafiosi, all kinds of people. And I could see clearly that the reason we should love everybody is that all are really seeking this bliss. And no matter how bad they may be now, they're only s bad because they think that will give you happiness but it, they find in time that it won't. And really, when you know that and you feel it, and you look at everybody and you see that potential, you can't help loving them. So this is what Master brought to us. He b gave us that sense of understanding that underlying everything, there is this bliss of God. God made the universe out of that bliss. And some people have said, that he wants to, he made it because he wants to enjoy himself through many. I think a better explanation would be that it's the nature of God who is bliss to want to expand himself. That bliss wants to expand itself because that's the nature of bliss. And so he has to create the universe and after a time withdraw it and create it again. And uh, it will go on because God, being bliss, has that expansive desire ever new. And another thing, when you think of this huge, complex universe, how could God be childlike and create such a universe? Doesn't seem possible. 
the complexity of everything. No two snowflakes are alike. And yet somehow God creates that. And I've understood that it means that when you become zero in your ego, you can go in any direction. And from that zero, you can produce this vast complexity. So God being zero can do everything. And this is very good for all of us. Because if we can reduce our own sense of ego to nothing, there's nothing we can't do. From that zero, you can go in any direction and produce everything. So think of that very seriously for yourselves. The less important you feel yourself to be, the less uh, worthy you feel yourself to be. You know, it's a funny thing for me. I was just thinking today, here in my old age, I developed a deep voice. And a deep voice usually sounds very authoritative and important. And I puzzled about that. Why would it become deep in my old age? I mean, I think I've hit the lowest note on the piano. And uh, yet I think that it's because, uh, well, there's a story of one time I was at a function. And afterwards, there was a girl I was talking to, a young woman outside. And then I asked her her name, and I, she told me. She said, what's your name? And I said, Swami Kriyananda. <gasps> Swami Kriyananda, but you're, you're famous. I said, well, maybe, but why that word but? And she said, well, all the other famous people I've met seemed important. And I was very delighted with that answer, because it pleased me not to be important. So I wondered, why do I have to have a voice that sounds so important? I'm not important. I want you to know that. I'm just a snowflake. But uh, it is a curious thing. Maybe one of you will have an answer to why in my old age I should develop this very deep. And I suppose it sounds authoritative. I don't have to hear it. I'm behind it. But uh, it's a curiosity for me on this. Any other questions? Yeah. I'm 60 and I'm still a child. That's the spirit. And I'm 84 and I'm still a child. I take care of adult matters, but I don't want to grow up. Yeah, I was like that as a child. I wanted to be like Peter Pan. Yes. That's very nice. A year ago, I didn't know Ananda or a yoga or Buddha from a rough and tire. I heard. What's he saying? He said a year ago he didn't. Yeah, I know that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but then he said something else. No, he was just. Okay. I saw your photo. He what? Saw your photo. Or knew that one day I didn't know where you were or what you were doing. Well, I'm grateful for that. Well, you know, many people have had visions of me and dreamed of me, and given I've given them advice that, in fact, I would have given them if I'd been able to do so. And I've wondered about that, because I'm not aware of it. And there was this interesting story that helps me to understand it. There was a woman in India who was going to see her guru. And she was crossing a stream when she, her foot slipped and she was about to be carried away by the stream when her guru appeared there and saved her and took her over the other bank and then disappeared. And when she came to him, she thanked him for saving her life. He said, what are you talking about? And she explained this thing to him. He didn't know anything about it. So it seems as if there's a certain point in your evolution where the soul knows things that the ego doesn't know. And uh, so many things that I've had happen like this, I don't know about. And when you speak, or you, many people speak of having seen me in dreams or visions and so on, I have to say I'm not conscious of that. And I know Master was. I remember one time I had a curious experience. I was fascinated because I knew nothing about the 
teachings and or anything. I was very new. And I decided I wanted to know what all this idea is of the astral world and physical, I mean, astral, per um, no, possession. And so I remember this dream. I remember it clearly right now. And I, I said, I'd like to know what this is all about, getting possessed by an evil spirit. And so I was at a party, and all of a sudden, I had in the dream the thought, it's time for me to go and meet a disincarnate spirit. And I went into a room. The floorboards were uh, uncovered. They were bare floorboards. And I stood in the middle of the room, and I said, all right, come. And all of a sudden, the floor started to heave, and I felt myself being sucked out the window. And I thought, well, this has gone beyond playing. And I tried to get back, and I found it was not so easy as I would have liked. So I called Master. The moment I said, Master, I woke up, and uh, everything was gone, and it was fine. So I asked Master about this later, and he said, yes, it was a true experience. He asked me about it first, and I explained to him. And uh, he said, yes, this sort of thing does happen sometimes. Don't be afraid, just have faith in God. But I was puzzled because he'd asked me, and I thought, well, you, you're you asking me questions when you're the one who did it. So I said to him, didn't you know? Don't you know about it? And his answer was very interesting. He said, when you become one with God, you are God. So we have to realize that a great master like Yogananda is God. There's no other thing to attain. That's an amazing concept. But uh, the question you had there, I think that desire made it happen. Who knows? But it's a beautiful story, and thank you. This small group of people is from Ananda Encinitas. What's that? There are these five people are from Ananda Encinitas. Okay. Well, I know Casey asked me that today. <laughs> You're getting double gun here. <laughs> well, maybe I will. Maybe I will. Right now, that's not my priority, but uh, maybe I will. I suspect my book about rescuing Yogananda will cause an explosion. And uh, Master one time said, God won't come to you until the end of life. Death itself is a final sacrifice you have to make. And I've wondered sometimes if that meant that I would be martyred. And I thought, well, that's fine. I don't care how I go. Being martyred seems like a much more useful death than just dying naturally in your sleep. So I'd be happy to be martyred. But uh, um, I know that this book could cause that kind of rage in SRF. I have not said pleasant things. And I have undermined or attacked or whatever, but not in a spirit of attack. I hope that Daya, whom I've said things that I know to be true, that uh, could even cause her death, because she doesn't come out as a, a pretty picture at all. And yet, I, she's a dear friend of mine, and I know she doesn't feel that way toward me, but I do feel that way toward her. And I, I hope this book helps her if in nothing else, at least in her soul evolution. Because she needs these truths. She needs to hear them. So I think that this book is going to change things drastically. I don't know in what way. I doubt that anybody will try to kill me because of it. Because why kill the messenger when the message has already been delivered? <laughs> so I don't know. But uh, we'll see. I think if you haven't read that book, you'll, you, I can't say you'll enjoy it, because it's not a pleasant picture, but it's a very important one. I really have done it to try to save Masters, on the way he's known, his reputation, especially here in Los Angeles. Okay, any other questions? Help me. Well, one this morning you talked about doubt 
helping you develop faith? Answer. So I'm tell sorry, me. I was <laughs> well, I found with doubt that the answer to doubt is not is not so not getting your resolves doubts resolved, because if you resolve a thousand of them, another thousand will spring into the breach. They are constantly self-producing thing. But when you love, you no longer doubt. So I went through a period of doubt with Master, and I found that the answer was not having those doubts solved, but because I loved him, I came through that severe test. So your faults, you understand that they don't make you happy, and so you decide you want to get out of them. I knew that doubting had caused me great suffering, and I didn't know how to get out of it. Love was the answer to that. But we have so many other faults than doubt, and we have to go through it. But once we've gone through it, it becomes a strong virtue because we no longer are drawn in that direction. You, you, you find, for example, that money, which may have been very important to you, Suddenly you understand it has no meaning at all. That's why I refuse all royalties on my books and music and so on. I just don't care. It doesn't mean anything. It has never given me happiness. And I've found that when I don't seek it, it comes to me when I need it. That's the wonderful thing that when you don't want a thing, it follows you like a dog. <laughs> any, other, any other questions? Okay. Well, in that case, I would like to um, ask Master to bless all of you. And I would like to have somebody lead chanting. And each of you in turn come and place your flower at the altar. And then come to me and kneel here. And I will ask Master to bless you. Okay?